Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 virtual Grand Canyon Star Party. I'm Ranger Raider Lane, the National Park Service coordinator for the event. You know, for 30 years running, Grand Canyon has been celebrating our pristine night skies through the annual Grand Canyon Star Party. Ordinarily, we invite hundreds of astronomers and thousands upon thousands of visitors to the park to enjoy eight nights of some of the darkest night skies in the United States. Each evening is typically kicked off with a special guest speaker. That's followed by telescope viewing, constellation programs, night sky photography workshops, and much, much more. Next year's Grand Canyon Star Party is June 5th through the 12th, 2021. So mark your calendars and fingers crossed we will be able to celebrate the Star Party next year on site. But this year, we, we decided to bring you a taste of the Star Party in the virtual realm. We wanna to try to mirror as best we can how a night of Grand Canyon Star Party might unfold on site. So we're lucky to start each evening from June 13th through the 20th, 2020, uh, with one of our special guest speakers who are all willing to share their talks online with us this year. And we're excited to bring you some of the wonders of the summer sky into your homes with our virtual telescope viewing sessions that will premiere right after this program. So stay tuned for that. But before we introduce our special guest uh, this evening, I just have a couple of entities the National Park Service would like to thank for their support in the event. First off, I have to thank the Grand Canyon Conservancy. Now they're the park's official nonprofit partner. They're doing amazing things in the park. Some of their current priorities include trail restoration, the Desert View Intertribal Heritage Site, which is an amazing project, revolutionary project happening out at Desert View Watchtower. They fund research and education within the park. And of course, one of their top priorities is night sky preservation. So through the generous support of Grand Canyon Conservancy and their supporters, Grand Canyon National Park over the last few years was able to inventory 5,000 lights in the park retrofit or change out about 1,500 of these lights with plans to retrofit many, many more within the next few years. And this allowed us to become certified as an international dark sky park in 2019. Um, and that makes us undoubtedly one of the most complex, highly visited international dark sky parks in the world. That very same year, Grand Canyon was awarded the distinction of international dark sky park of the year. And that was uh, uh, given to us by the International Dark Sky Association. This is the nonprofit entity that works to, uh, to establish communities and parks as international dark sky places. And their mission is to preserve and protect the nighttime environment and our heritage of dark skies through environmentally responsible outdoor lighting. We thank the International Dark Sky Association for their tremendous work, their tremendous staff, and we hope they keep it up. Finally, Grand Canyon's International Dark Sky Place of the Year could not have been achieved without the dedication, the passion, and the expertise of the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. They're our essential partner for the Grand Canyon Star Party. In our virtual star party following this presentation, please thank the astronomers in the chat room. They're gonna be populating the chat room, answering questions, and they do this out of pure love of the night skies and for Grand Canyon. The National Park Service is really proud to work with them in this endeavor. So with that, I want to introduce tonight's special guest speaker. Tonight, we are talking to Srinivasan Manivanan, AKA Srini, and uh, we are really excited to have him here. He is an astro landscape photographer and an International Dark Sky Association official delegate advocating for protecting dark skies around the world. He's been photo uh, photographing the night skies for almost 10 years now, and he's won uh, prestigious awards for his nightscape images. He works for GoPro and has been a contributor to the BBC Earth social media platform. Uh, for the past few years, he's started working with experimental technologies to capture dark skies, ranging from using low budget cameras to some of the recent advances in technology to capture night skies in real time videography, other than the traditional long exposure photography. Tonight, Srini is going to present the art of photographing dark skies, and we are really lucky to have him with us today. Um, so Srini, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Raider. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, talking about uh, some of my experience capturing night sky, and hope it will be like a learning experience for uh, the folks who are watching it. Um, let me start sharing my screen.
So tonight, uh, as uh, Rado mentioned, like uh, uh, going to be talking about the uh, art of photographing uh, dark skies, and uh, let's dive in. Tonight's agenda is basically to uh, uh, show you like how I've been like capturing night sky uh, over a period of time, and uh, I've uh, mastered some of the uh, techniques like uh, uh, panorama, and then uh, using 360 cameras, doing some time lapse photography. And then uh, uh, recently, like, uh, uh, dive into like uh, capturing videos in real time. My story as a night sky photographer kind of like started uh, way back in 2011. Uh, I was born in Chennai uh, in South India. It's basically like a proper uh, city where I couldn't even like see few stars if I want to like go up on my terrace and uh, look at it. And I moved to US, I've been like living here for almost like uh, uh, 14 years now. And uh, even then, like till 2011, I never uh, got to see like dark skies. And the first time I went to Utah, that's when like uh, the whole inspiration started. Like basically I was in complete awe of looking at the Milky Way arching above me. And this got me into uh, capturing dark skies. And then I got acquainted with the uh, uh, International Dark Sky Association, uh, who have been like uh, doing great work in protecting dark skies around the world. And uh, so, hence, like I started capturing some of the, some of my photographs and time lapses, and been like collaborating with them uh, uh, since then. And I've also been uh, able to like provide uh, some uh, public uh, uh, talks around the. Uh, town I live here in uh, San Francisco Bay Area as well. Like I started working with uh, GoPro since 2016, and I've been like working with them uh, in developing some of the cameras, low light capabilities, and uh, it's it's been a great uh, pleasure uh, uh, trying to experiment with all these budget cameras where you will be able to like uh, capture night sky, which wasn't even like possible a few years back. And then recently, like uh, 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 I started shooting some of the night sky with uh, the latest technological advancements based on the sensor technology uh, able to like capture all these uh, milky way shots in real time rather than in long exposure so let's go in and uh, i'll show you some of the details um so uh so in terms of like nightscape photography so these are the basic settings uh, uh generally like pe people would want to know so as a nightscape photographer, like I always prefer my lenses to have like a uh, really uh, low value of aperture, which is basically like a big aperture. So for example, like uh, aperture 1.4, 1.82. So these are some of the aperture settings, like basically be able to like capture a lot of light. And similarly, in terms of shutter speed, like uh, technically if you're shooting a long exposure shot, uh, it all depends on how much time you would want to expose your uh, camera sensor so that you will be able to like, capture enough amount of light. So these are some of the uh, um, variables like which you would end up using. And similarly, like ISO, the light sensitivity of the sensor, which is like really important, uh, especially when you want to like capture some of these shots with low noise or relatively like uh, uh, to get the high, higher details and shadows and highlights. Being a more of a documentary style photographer, I've always like preferred my night photos as a single image rather than like doing uh, a lot of stacking and post processing. So pretty much what you, whatever you see here is all like single images and no stacking involved except for like star trail images. And then obviously like uh, some of the white balance uh, that I prefer like when I'm trying to shoot night sky is like closer to like 4000 K, uh, which is actually preferred in terms of like getting the true colors of the Milky Way and the true colors of the night sky. And uh, uh, also the, uh, another, another important uh, factor is uh, going to like uh, trying to focus your uh, uh, camera so that it captures the stars like pinpoint. So yeah, these are some of the manual settings you may need to like get uh, acquainted with before even like you try and capture night sky. Moving on to the next one, tips for night sky photography. So uh, the key thing about night sky photography is like uh, uh, being an ast astral landscape photographer, uh, I do not do a lot of uh, deep sky imaging. So I am there to capture the experience, like basically uh, me standing there, like trying to get get to see the amount of stars that we are not able to see from the city uh, uh, environments. So, so the key thing is like trying to get your 
composition first like basically trying to compose your shot with the milky way or with with the stars along with the environment like for example in this image like i was able to go uh deep into a crevice like where i was able to like capture this cave uh right about like arching up arching over like pacific ocean uh with the milky way streaking across so similarly uh uh the keep key, thing about like nightscape photography like astro landscape photography is about the composition and then like you need to figure out your lighting conditions based on that you need to figure out like which lenses to use and then uh, 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 which iso like uh, like i mentioned in the previous slide so all these things put together you will be able to like uh, uh, figure out like what is the optimum amount of like iso needed what is the best lens to be used or like depending on the uh, ambient light like whether you have like moonlight or whether you have some kind of like light, light pollution uh, so based on that try and figure out like uh, the optimum amount of uh, uh, things and then move forward with your shot Uh, in general, like uh, uh, if you have been like familiar with photography, uh, raw format is uh, one of the most important things for nightscape photography. Uh, so it, that's basically because like if you see on the left hand side and the right hand side in the screen, like left is basically shot, uh, like it's basically straight out of the camera, a JPEG processed by the camera. And the right hand side is a raw format and I was able to like extract a lot of details from here. Like for example, like you see all those fall colors, the beautiful colors, which is not actually visible on your, on the left. Whereas I was able to like pop all these colors and uh, make it look more uh, uh, like get, get a lot of details of the shadows and then like adjust the highlights, get the true colors of the Milky Way and all those things. So it's, it's all about like getting the details and uh, uh, get, like sh showcasing what you actually want to showcase like on a particular shot. So for that, like raw format actually is really helpful and I would definitely like uh, uh, encourage people to use raw format when they are actually shooting low light. Going on to the next one, like, like uh, as I told you, like composition is one of the key things I always look for when I'm actually down uh, uh, in the field trying to capture stuff. So uh, here are some of the composition techniques I've been like using over the years, uh, which is pretty much like uh, pretty common. Uh, if you've seen like uh, other uh, um, photography techniques that's being used. So I'm here like uh, kind of like showcasing uh, some of the things which I use for my night sky uh, photoscapes. So in the left leg, you see that uh, clear like leading line where uh, 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 when I went there, it was all like icy, it's, it's, it's a bowl. Uh, vast frozen lake and there was this nice rock so I thought it might be interesting and moved forward with that and then I was able to see this uh, half thawed ice and on top of that there's a lot, lot of snow uh, pack and I thought okay this might be like really interesting and I put it on a time lapse mode on uh, the camera and then I kind of like hopped over that rock and stood there so this kind of like uh, keeps the user more focused where it kind of like cranes your eye towards the Milky Way and similarly on the right, like I always like when I go out, like I try to look for reflections. On this particular night, I was in Yosemite National Park. It was like beautiful. Like it was like a lot of snow, fresh snow. And then uh, 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 the, the, the reflection that you see here is basically right off the Merced River. It's actually a river, but then like uh, due to the low water conditions during winter, it kind of like becomes completely still on a really still night so it kind of like reflects beautifully and that's how like i wanted to uh like plan my shot like basically i found some reflection i found these all these like a uh, beautiful snow clad trees and half of them was like visible with some light moving mist around and if you notice the orange glow there it's actually light pollution caused by the cars moving around so i was able to like capture one particular scene where this light pollution of the glow has also been being captured here So moving on to the next, so uh, if you see on the left, I try to capture like unique subjects. So uh, for example, like uh, if I go to the coast, I try to see uh, if there is any interesting, unique subjects there we can try to capture. So on this occasion, like, I was just like walking around the coast and uh, uh, I didn't know what to shoot. And suddenly there was a huge spider, like uh, basically spider web uh, right in front of me. I was like 
first thing it was jittery like i got scared and then realized okay this might be a very really interesting opportunity for me to shoot this and uh, uh, if you notice the milky way was right aligned behind it and i couldn't ask for more so basically i could get the milky way and this huge spider web right in one particular frame and uh, if you notice like another thing is basically uh, uh, this was shot with a 14 mm wide lens so you, you can imagine like how big the spider web was and uh, and luckily, like I was able to get this uh, beautiful web and with the spider right on the center. And obviously, like when you're shooting all these wildlife stuff, you sh should make sure that you're not disturbing the wildlife. So I maintained my distance with the spider as well as like I was able to like uh, uh, throw a little bit of uh, soft light on it so that I was able to distinguish the spider web and the background like night sky. And similarly on the right, uh, I was using the natural lighting. So on the left, it was more of artificial lighting and on the right, it was natural. So it's basically the moonlight, the full moon, which is creating this beautiful moon bow uh, just below the Yosemite waterfall. So Yosemite is famous for all these moon bows, especially during like uh, early, early uh, spring to uh, uh, early summer. So when the water flow is like really good, uh, you will be able to like see these moon bows uh, when the moon strikes the uh, uh, mist of the waterfall. So uh, again, like using using the natural light to capture some images is like something you can actually think about like when you're uh, uh, venturing out. And it need not be like a perfectly dark night where there was moon, but there was no moon. But even with moon, you will be able to like create some magical images. And the next one is like trying to use creative lighting, as I told you, like in the previous slide. So uh, this one was completely dark. This this place is like one of the darkest places I've seen. And uh, this was in Arizona. And uh, uh, when I was driving there, like I found this uh, beautiful rock, and we thought of like capturing uh, night sky there. And I was there, and, and this is my first photograph uh, officially with my kid standing. And she's like four, she was like four year old when I shot that. And I was like, we were kind of like playing a contest with her. Like if, you, if you're able to like stand there for like seven seconds, you will get a candy. So something like that. And uh, she was there, she cooperated and we got this beautiful shot uh, with our family together along with the Milky Way. And here, since it was like completely dark, I had to use some of the, uh, uh, the light from what I had. I kind of like uh, light painted ourselves and kind of made it look like a silhouette kind of stuff. And also like I was able to get some details out of the rock. And on the right hand side, it's a completely contrary image. Like it's an aerial photography. Uh, so you can also think about like with the, some of the recent advancement with uh, the, the sensor technology, you will be able to like capture like really fast images. So for example, on the left hand side, it was like a six or seven second shot. But primarily when I do all these long exposure shots, I shoot it for like 30 seconds. So if you up your ISOs, you will be able to like reduce your shutter speed. So the, the, this slide is exa exactly the uh, example of how it is done. And on the right, I shot this for like a three second shot. And I up my ISO and also the Aurora, Aurora glow was like really, really bright. And I shot this from an airplane. Uh, moving on to the next, um, you can think about like really unique perspectives. Like as I told you, like in the beginning, like 360 camera technology is like uh, advancing much now nowadays. And uh, this was shot with a 360 camera, so you can you can you can get like pretty unique perspectives uh, with some of these 360 cameras, and you can plan like how you want to shoot the things. Like uh, you can't even imagine like how you can actually get it with a uh, regular rectilinear camera unless like you uh, kind of like capture like multiple images, just everything together. So these kind of like 360 cameras bring forward a lot of unique perspectives uh, going forward. And uh, similarly on the right, it's not always about like a really wide angle camera, right? Like basically you can use your telephoto lenses to capture Milky Way like uh, uptight, like more, uh, more, more like a really zoomed in uh, kind of stuff. And I was planning this shot for a while. Like I wanted this lighthouse just in front of the Milky Way in between the uh, core. And I was able to like get one particular night where it was like the, the, fo the coastal fog was completely out. It was like perfectly clear. And uh, uh, I planned it in such a way that I wanted to shoot this with a 50 mm lens so that I get a very intimate scene captured. 
So that, that gives you a totally different perspective of being uh, shooting this same scene with a wide angle lens compared to a telephoto lens. Uh, another favorite technique of mine is uh, panorama. So uh, I obviously like the night sky is vast and especially the landscapes that we have in the, the US, like basically you get a really wide landscape where you won't be able to like capture it with one rectilinear lens. So because of that, I started doing all these panorama techniques, like basically to capture the whole frame. I like, for example, this one is like, a, uh, I put my camera in a, a portrait mode, like basically do all these vertical shots. So for example, like from moving left to the right, uh, probably like uh, I would have shot like uh, uh, seven or eight shots um, with overlaps so that I will be able to put them back together and stitch them everything. For example, in this shot, I wanted to capture Milky Way right in the center of my frame. And I wanted like a beautiful panorama covering all these like two first, two first standing in the front uh, and uh, the reflection of the two first as well as the reflection of the stars. So I had to like plan this and then compose it uh, right off of like when I was trying to shoot. And then so I was able to like uh, think on what I wanted and then based on that shoot it. And the next one is all about the scale. So in the previous image, you saw all those two first standing, but you don't know like how big are those. So to portray that, I started using human element in here. So for example, like this arch, which is in Joshua, Joshua Tree National Park, uh, is a really famous arch. But then like when I was shooting this, like I wanted to shoot this Milky Way arching about the double arch. And I knew that, okay, so we don't know the scale of this thing. So we don't know how big it is. So I wanted to, like put someone inside. Like basically uh, I was with my wife and she was uh, really uh, 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 good enough for me to like go and stand there for almost like 15, 20 minutes when I was trying to pan this shot and take a shot of her. So again, like with the scale, the whole landscape becomes more interesting. Like it gives, it gives the, uh, like the uh, viewer a perspective of what they are actually seeing. So that's, that's again like a very important factor like in capturing uh, landscape and night sky together. Uh, moving into the next topic, like basically time lapse photography. This is uh, one of my favorite things. Like when I go out, uh, I enjoy stars like more than capturing them. So because of that, this ha this kind of like gave me time. Like basically, if you are there for like two to three hours capturing this, I kind of like put the camera, put it on timer, or rather like put it on time lapse mode, and then. Uh, uh, after that, like, it's just like, take my time off for like two to three hours enjoying the stars. So this was a immaculate opportunity for me to enjoy nature as well as when I, when I was actually capturing some work for my thing. So key things about time-lapse photography. So first thing is like composition. So you need to compose your shot before you even start because you're kind of like investing two to three hours of your time uh, capturing these things. So assuming like you do not compose it first, uh, properly, then you're almost like ending up wasting so much time. So that's one of the key things. I always look for the f shot, which is going to be interesting throughout the two to three hours. Hopefully nature cooperates. So for, for example, like you can plan on like, uh, uh, you can put a, put a slider or you can have like some kind of like camera movement or uh, uh, depending on like what you're actually trying to shoot. And another benefit of like using time lapse photography is like you can create a single image uh, of your maximum interest. For example, like if there was some kind of like moon rise or uh, some kind of like cloud formation, which you really like uh, one amongst like several photos that you have already shot, you can pick that shot and make it as a single image or you can make it as a video or you can kind of like stack everything together to make it as a star trail. So for example, this is a short video about of a moon set. And this was captured with a GoPro camera, by the way. And here is a short piece of the time lapse for recently. Thank you. 
So uh, if you notice, like uh, all those shots that I've taken, like it's all about the movement. Like basically, that the stars move. Obviously, or like, there are like a lot of clouds movement. Like it kind of gives you that magical feel. And more than that, the light transformation. Like for example, like the moon rise. So it moves across the landscape. So these are some of the things that I always look for when I'm actually doing a time lapse. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So here you see like two shots, right? One is a meteor stack and the other one is a star trail. So meteor stack, like whenever, whenever I'm out like shooting meteors, like meteor shower, so I always like first frame it. And as I told you, like framing is one of the key aspects of like uh, uh, time-lapse photography. So um, I first frame it. Like for example, here it was Geminids and uh, I try to find a spot where uh, all these meteors is going to align with some kind of like landscape. So, and then this part, like the Pigeon Point Lighthouse in California, like came to my mind where uh, the meteors will be like right behind it. And I was able to find a spot where I was able to compose this shot uh, how I wanted it to be. And another key thing about this shot was like, you see that green dot on the right hand corner. So that's basically a, a comet. So on that particular night, the comet was there, the meteors were there, and of course the beautiful landscape was there. So I was able to capture everything in one particular time lapse and put everything together and stack all those uh, uh, meteors that I got of that particular time lapse and put it as a single frame. And on the right, this is a star trail. Like basically once you have all these images, you can just like stack it together and you will be able to get all these nice streaks of light where the stars have moved rather because of the earth rotation, the stars, uh, uh, the stars make a trail. So because of that, you will be able to see those nice, beautiful lines arching across the sky. Moving on to the next one, like the work, working with uh, budget cameras. As I told you, like I have been working with GoPro for almost like four years now. So since I joined them, like I was able to like uh, have the privilege of using these cameras for nightscape photography specifically. And um, whenever I go, like I try to uh, do some um, testing, trying to see like how we can improve uh, uh, the uh, not, not, like the low light capabilities of these cameras. And uh, you can see this, basically this was shot with a GoPro. So, so the similar scene that you already saw, it was a shot actually on the same night. And uh, you see those stars streaking and like you're able to like see the lo lot of details on your uh, landscape. And uh, um, the the more 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 about like all these uh, budget cameras are like it's it's kind of like cheap enough for anyone to to grab one and then they will be able to like take it on uh, on their travel or like whenever they are actually going out to uh, visit a park or like uh, uh, go check out like basically do do some stargazing so they can take these along and even if they're not going to try and invest a lot of amount on on these uh, high ex highly expensive lenses or like camera bodies. So these, these can actually help take some, some of the shots, which would be able to like capture their experience. Uh, also like these kind of uh, budget cameras, they also like help me in propagating the uh, agenda of like dark scale production, like where these things make people to go and enjoy the experience and enjoy as well as to capture the experience. And nowadays, like even smartphones are able to like capture really decent images of night sky. And here's another example, like this was shot with the uh, GoPro. And, uh, So you see that like basically a budget camera was able to like capture so many details, especially in a time lapse and stuff. So it got me interested uh, on that side. On the contrary, I started experimenting with real time videos of night sky. So with the recent advances in sense technology, so it made possible for us to like capture dark skies with, with these cameras in real time and not a traditional long exposure shot. And 
So this is one small example where the car moving on the roadside was able to like create all these shadows. And when I noticed it with my real eyes, like basically I knew that this is a really good candidate for a real time video and I shot that. And yeah, as I told you, like this gives you the real perspective of night sky where people are experiencing that. And the next one is a kind of like a short film I made. Um, so you can check this out too. Exploring the night sky, a natural wonder that has guided and fascinated man since antiquity has always had its humble beginnings. Thanks to technologies today, this marvel can be enjoyed in real time on the California coast that serves as one of the last places on earth that facilitates this expedition. Wildflowers in the milieu savor the endless sky by dancing to the lullaby sung by the sea with its waves while stars glitter all working in tandem to create a mystic aura. The eerie silence, broken only by the ocean and chirping of crickets, only adds to this mysticism. However, just like in the day, life thrives in the night as well. this why the Milky Way smiles at us on Earth at this ungodly hour, a sight worth staying up for the whole night. The inquisitive photographer wonders in amazement at the plethora of celestial objects that can be seen even with the naked eye. Why? A view bridge only offers more opportunities to appreciate this mesmerizing spectacle. Indeed, the cosmos is a hypnotic nymph who has enamored humans with her captivating charisma since time immemorial. But artificial light is never far away. On a cliff in the distance, an otherwise polluting lighthouse serving as a beacon not only adds to the grandeur of the darkness, but also serves as a stark reminder of light pollution caused by man. This relatively untouched environment provided by California's beaches, a safe cabin to fauna like desert rattlers and other creatures may be hostile. But venturing out into this wilderness has its own advantages of providing glimpses for the Milky Way, not seen by two-thirds of the world populace. The group seems to have realized this and are seen reveling in the tranquility like our forefathers did on the beach. What better way to enjoy this extravaganza than with a little warmth listening to the waves under the expansive sky? Lucky then. The night turns colder and the warm above perched on the precipice is extremely inviting to tired human legs. But a sight as enticing as this overrides such comforts, especially when viewed with a loved one. As the Milky Way fades away into the dawn, it leaves us with the realization that man is nothing but a blip on this vast canvas called universe. As per some studies, the night sky is visible to only one third of the people in the world. This video is a small step in showcasing this treasure of immense timeless beauty that must be cherished and preserved for generations to come. Uh, almost coming to the end now. So uh, key things to remember, like when you're actually out shooting. So uh, as you see, like I first find dark skies, like basically you see the map down. So that there are like multiple maps available in the web where you'll be able to like search for all these uh,
beautiful dark skies around the US as well as around the world. And uh, so you see all these color codings here, like when you're actually on the red zone, you're pretty much like very much near the uh, vicinity of the city, like 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 polluted like city. And once you move towards all these greens and blues and grays, you the visibility of the stars will become even much, much better. And uh, uh, once you are in the gray, that's probably gray or the black zone, which is kind of like uh, totally free of light pollution. You will be able to like see the stars right to the horizon. And uh, other factors are like how you trying to focus in the dark, like either you have the lenses which can do like infinite focus or like if you want to like uh, do some manual focusing like or like autofocus on your subject, depends on like what kind of lens and body you have. And another thing like navigating in the dark, like we need to be like, uh, it's a very challenging, challenging task and uh, um, you need to kind of like uh, master this thing. Like basically uh, I always prefer going out especially to a place which I haven't been like previously, like in the evening or something to scout out the location so that uh, safety is one of the paramount uh, things, right? Basically, uh, when I'm out, I need to be safe. So especially in the dark, you need to first try and be safe and uh, also like avoid local noise. And a few other things are like, uh, uh, remember all these like creative lighting techniques uh, uh, and creative uh, composition techniques. And then uh, you, make sure that you have all the gear especially uh, uh maybe like a couple of batteries so that if at all like your battery runs down and uh plan for weather like obviously you don't want to end up in a place where it's going to be like a lot of cloud or like a lot of fog so check for local weather whenever you are going out as well as like any hazardous conditions like uh, uh if you're going to the coast like do not go during a really high tide where uh, it will be it's kind of like dangerous and also like check for road conditions and other stuff like mainly like check for hazards and be safe out there so yeah these are some of the key things i generally always follow when i'm out shooting and this is probably some kind of like guideline which i thought i will be able to like share with you guys and that's about it um so we are at the end so you can bring in your questions all right well thanks Shri. that's a uh, uh, quite the presentation and the live video technology is astounding i mean that's pretty exciting uh what what kind of possibilities do you see with that type of technology going forward i mean in terms of what's what's possible to do uh i believe like uh with the live videos that uh, with the recent cameras are able to take. So that's one of the more experimental things that it did. And uh, um, if you notice, like, there'll be like a lot of noise and uh, uh, it's not like a perfectly beautiful image, long exposure image that you generally see. It's kind of like noisy, it's not like perfect, uh, but then it's experimental. So once these technologies grow and you're able to like get more out of all these sensors in the future, you will be able to like capture these things like really beautifully in real time and that's really like excites me a lot and one more thing is like you, you are able to like capture them and share them with uh people so it's not like a long exposure shot like basically it's what you actually see with your real eyes and that makes it more appealing for uh folks like basically trying to spread the word about like protecting night skies so that's one of the key key aspects I've been like uh, exa exa really excited about. Yeah, me too. That just looks amazing. And one last question. I mean, what 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 is it about Grand Canyon specific conditions that would attract someone like you, uh, an astrophotographer, to come to the site and shoot the night skies? Uh, of course, like like pollution. Like I really love Grand Canyon for. Uh, uh, the darkness that it can present. And uh, if you see like basically like uh, if you go kind of like go hike down to the river level, that kind of gives you a totally different perspective of the canyon, like from shooting it up. Uh, another thing is like, um, especially like uh, I believe you, you guys also get all these uh, inversions, right? So for example, like if you do some time lapses from top of the canyon and if these inversions happen, that'll be like really beautiful, especially if it does happen during the night. So all the fog and stuff moving around in the canyon and then the stars moving. So that'll be like perfect scenario. 
and especially <laughs> like moon, with moonlight like if there is moonlight the time lapses will be like really stunning with all the shadows and highlights moving you know right wanting to have a little bit of moonlight there to be able to catch some of the features of the canyons exactly. like the temples and buttes and such yeah yeah well thank you so much Srini. that was a, a very instructive uh presentation i hope people got uh some useful information out of that hopefully uh everybody will be able to see Srini, you know next year at grand canyon star party 2021 he was with us last year providing on-site photography workshops the 2021 Grand Canyon Star Party is June 5th through the 12th. So again, mark your calendars for that. And hopefully uh, both Srini and I will be able to see you all on site. Uh, please stay tuned. Right after this uh, presentation, we are premiering uh, our virtual telescope viewing sessions, our virtual star party. So stay tuned for that. And once again, we hope you all have uh, a, a wonderful year and clear dark skies. And we hope to see you next year at Grand Canyon Star Party 2021. Thanks so much, Srini. Yep, thanks, Raider. Thanks, everyone.